Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. So um, I, I normally would say thank you for the opportunity to speak, but I, I have to say, I, I don't know, uh, Genesis, if you did me a favor by having me follow Professor Snyder, because that was just an outstanding presentation. I've learned so much uh, and I'm thinking, what more can I add? So thanks, but no thanks for, for this, uh, uh, the, the, the order. But, but seriously, I, I do want to uh, thank you and uh, Dean Crowell and of course, uh, Peter Phillips, uh, Professor Peter Phillips uh, for this outstanding program that we now know has been seven or eight years and for assembling a wonderful cross section of ADR representatives from the American Arbitration Association and my good friend Bill Johnston and his law firm and just really bringing the community together um, and for giving me this opportunity to take a few moments to share and to reflect on where we are, how far we've come, and then what else we can do to continue to advance uh, diversity in ADR. Um, I think we can start by saying we can all be grateful for this opportunity to really examine and then remedy the longstanding and systemic inequities in the dispute resolution field, which uh, is a small but significant slice really of the whole racial injustice and inequity that we see nationwide that really require us to have renewed commitment uh, and serious approaches and if we're going to manifest change. Uh, this is especially important to me, not only as president of the ABA, but also um, as a woman of color who is involved in international arbitration for more than uh, 30 plus years. Um, but let me begin my remarks by going back a little bit because I think it's important to put things in a historical, not hysterical context. Uh, so the ABA was founded in August of 1878 and the first women were admitted 40 years later in 1918. However, in 1912, the ABA rescinded the membership of William H. Lewis, who was the first black assistant US Attorney General. And he had been elected to membership, that's when we used to elect ABA members, in 1911. So essentially, this restricted membership to white lawyers until the ABA passed a resolution in 1943 stating that ABA membership would not be dependent on race, creed, or color. So, and then it wasn't until 1950 uh, when uh, a black lawyer was admitted to membership. So 1950, first black lawyer really fully admitted. Uh, in 1995, the first woman became president of the ABA. That was Roberta Cooper Ramo. And in 2015, Paulette Brown, who I know many of us know, became the first African-American woman president of the ABA. And then last August, 144 years after its founding, I became the second African-American woman president. Uh, so why do I bring this up? It's because recalling our past, it can be painful but it's necessary uh, because we cannot fix that which we do not acknowledge. Uh, we know that one of the ABA's four articulated goals is to eliminate bias and enhance diversity by promoting full and equal participation in the legal profession by those who have historically been denied opportunities, including women, people of color, people with disabilities and people of differing sexual orientation and gender identities. We recognize that clients and the public are better served when organizations are diverse and inclusive at every level. And we equally recognize that despite significant efforts, and there have been significant efforts, 
the legal profession as a whole grossly lags behind other professions regarding diversity and inclusion. And why is this important is because we also know that confidence in our legal systems is declining. According to the ABA's 2022 civics survey, 52% of respondents agreed with the statement, quote, the justice system has racial biases built into its rules, procedures, and practices. Among young people aged 18 to 36, 63% said that there was racial bias. And Black people continue to see racial bias at higher levels than other groups. So while less than half, about 48% of white people see racial bias, 54% of Hispanics do, and 75% of black people responded that there is racial bias in the system. Now, why do I quote these statistics? It's because we can see that there is a clear need for participants to see themselves represented in order to restore confidence in the legal system. And that includes ADR. So despite the ABA's longstanding goal of diversity and inclusion, it actually wasn't until 2016 that, that we had our House of Delegates adopt a resolution urging that all providers of legal services, including law firms and corporations, expand and create opportunities at all levels of responsibility for diverse attorneys and urging clients to assist in the facilitation of opportunities for diverse attorneys and to direct a greater percentage of their legal services that they purchase to both currently and in the future to diverse attorneys. And I can tell you that as we know, many people know the ABA's House of Delegates is the policy making arm. And that's where more than 600 lawyers gather uh, to debate resolutions. And this was a hotly debated resolution, but in the end it did pass. Um, and I, I'm happy to say that the resolution did its job uh, because it inspired various tools and strategies that the ABA produced and elsewhere uh, to promote diversity in the profession. And it also got the attention of our dispute resolution section, uh, which noted that AB ADR does lag behind the other professions, uh, legal profession. And so that was the impetus for another resolution that was adopted by the ABA in 2018 that urged providers of domestic and international dispute resolution to expand their rosters. Uh, so it's one thing to ask that we uh, have our clients think about their legal spend and uh, think about how they can hire more diverse attorneys, but we also need the partnership of the institutions uh, to be able to think about expanding their rosters with more minority and women and people with disabilities and people with di diverse sexual orientation to be on those rosters, to be neutrals. Um, and I'm pleased to say that a number of those institutions have stepped up and have made concerted efforts to do just that. Um, the report accompanying that ADR resolution did acknowledge the significant efforts of dispute resolution providers, um, but it is still uh, more that we can do. Um, so there's that. On the other hand, another problem that undermines efforts to enhance diverse selection of neutrals is lack of transparency. Um, and when you have that lack of transparency, it reduces public awareness of the absence of diversity in dispute resolution. So in the past, there was no incentive for outside counsel or institutional service providers, um, established neutrals and others to take proactive steps without that client pressure. But as the largest, most prominent and most diverse organization of lawyers in the US, uh, the ABA exercises its voice for the legal profession in this and many other areas. Uh, and let me just quickly tell you about a couple of things that the ABA's 
section of dispute resolution is continuing to do to try and enhance uh, the number of diverse neutrals and diverse professionals, uh, including there will be, they're having their 25th anniversary, 25th annual dispute resolution spring conference. That's taking place uh, May 10th through 13th in Las Vegas, if you're interested. But it's going to feature a number of diversity related programs. Um, their theme is leading change through ADR, strategies for navigating our world today. Um, there's going to be programming on self-determination of indigenous people in ADR. The diversity dilemma is checking the box enough, eliminating barriers to use of arbitration by tribal government, and what's going on, an overview of dispute resolution DEI initiatives across the US. You're, you people on this webinar may also be interested to know that the section of dispute resolution has sponsored a fellowship program in which they select 20 dispute resolution fellows and provide them opportunities to gain experience in the section. And those candidates come from diverse backgrounds and they are encouraged. So if you want more information about that, you should go to the ABA's um, uh, section of dispute resolution to get information about that program. Um, there's also a women in dispute resolution committee uh, at the in, in that section and both are incredibly strong. They have over 600 members uh, and it is a really good way to network and make sure that you're getting the latest information um, about dispute resolution. Uh, I say all of that because it can be frustrating when we are doing so much, but it feels like we're not making as much progress as some of us would like to see. But I think we must constantly challenge ourselves and then take concrete affirmative steps to, to, to make the change that we want to see. And we need to continue shining a spotlight on the low level of diverse representation on neutral rosters and the special challenges created by the combination of the network-based culture within the profession, the implicit bias and the lack of transparency, again, that obscures the degree to which dispute resolution lags behind the legal profession as a whole. And I say this as someone who began my career in international arbitration in 1988 at the US Council for International Business, which many of you know, is the American National Committee for the ICC International Court of Arbitration. And I recall reviewing a list of neutrals that contained no women and no lawyers of color. And now it feels like I've come full circle because I serve on the nominations committee and I am really pleased to say that we've got a, a, a very large database. Um, and now we have one of the most diverse slates of arbitrators in the field, but still we don't think that's enough. And so we're challenging ourselves to make sure that we are always looking for diverse neutrals and providing them the opportunity to serve. We have made progress. We've made progress over time. Um, but we need to continue to encourage and engage all stakeholders to increase representation of diverse neutrals on rosters and to enhance their likelihood of success in the selection process. I know sometimes it feels like it's an uphill battle, but we can never tire and we have to press on. And I'm delighted to take part in this conversation and get the tools that New York Law School is providing so that we can keep keeping on and keep pressing on. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this really important conference. Uh, I look forward to it every year. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I don't know if you could tell, but I was just busily You're on mute. Oh, yep. Yeah. You're on mute. 
Can you hear me? Now I can. Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, I was just saying that I have so many notes from 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 your talk too. Uh, thank you so much, and I really appreciate taking us through this history because yeah. we have to understand what the context is for the discussion that we're having. Right? We're not, you know, parachuting in in 2023. We're talking about 150 years ago, right? Yes. And then 100 years ago, um, and then you see that the efforts of so many people to diversify the field to open those doors. Um, a lot of change is happening and has been happening, especially over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and so, oh, so, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to also say, and, and I think in some ways we're at an inflection point because mm -hmm. it feels like, uh, you know, in my background, we've started things like women in international arbitration. And I was there at the beginning of that. And there came a period where some of the younger women were saying, well, why do we need these groups anymore? Uh, and part of that, I think, is because they didn't understand what it was like not that long ago. I mean, it's you know, 25, 30 years ago uh, that there were no women on, mm -hmm. on these committees. And now, thankfully, we have groups like Women in International Arbitration that are really very strong but if we don't continue to nurture those groups and continue to help those groups grow, we can easily um, regress. So it's important that always, I believe it's always important to take a moment to reflect on how far we've come mm -hmm. and gain uh, you know, energy and strength and keep pushing forward. You know, I think it's interesting. ADR is, has traditionally lag, lagged a little bit and we're certainly catching up. Um, but it's an interesting field because a lot of people join or become a part of this field, sometimes not at the beginning of that legal career, but in the middle or at the end. And so you're seeing the cumulative efforts um, of, of groups of people surface in the ADR field. Um, and, and, you know, you talked about a lot of the initiatives that, that the ABA has been doing and that other people have been doing to, to diversify the field. But what are some other, you know, barriers to entry that that for the field that you, that you think that we still need to kind of be thinking about? So I think you're right in that uh, ADR tends, mo uh, in the past people came to ADR towards the end of their careers. Mm -hmm. if you either uh, what we saw a lot of times, especially in international arbitration is that you start off um, as counsel and then when you are retiring or moving on in your career, you think, oh, okay, now I'll sit as an arbitrator or retire judges who say, okay, I'll sit as an arbitrator. And because that was the pattern for so long, obviously that meant that there, it wasn't going to be as diverse because if you look at who was, was entering the legal profession you know, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. you didn't have the kinds of diverse classes that we see now. So it took time for that pipeline to grow and to become more diverse. So that's the first instance. I think if we can get younger people more involved at earlier stages in their careers, now that might mean for institutions in particular where they have smaller cases, uh, where they can perhaps be looking to diversify the rosters and give opportunities for those cases uh, to younger practitioners. There are, every institution, I'm sure we'll hear about it from the AAA, whether it's AAA or ICC uh, in the international arena, I mean, uh, all have the equivalent of young arbitrator forums and young mm -hmm. arbitrator committees. Uh, and that is to be encouraged. Uh, but I, I think we, as as clients, as consumers of international arbitration or ADR in general, we have to be more mindful about giving opportunities uh, to, our, to our younger uh, practitioners so that they can get that experience. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. You know, it's interesting that you talk about creating this pipeline um, and also making this field attractive to a range of people saying, there's a place for you here. Um, and I'll say, you know, for me, my background is civil rights and criminal defense. And so 
you know, being a public defender however many years ago, this was not a field that I knew very much about, right? Because it seems like public interest law can be a little siloed um, from, from, commercial, from the commercial field. And so making sure that everyone understands those opportunities and sees those opportunities certainly is important. Um, I do have a follow-up question about your, your comment about barriers and transparency and how transparency um, helps to increase diversity in the field. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Certainly. Uh, so when I you know, talked about those statistics um, from the civics survey, you know, that's very sobering to me where people believe there's bias built into our systems. Mm -hmm. uh, whether whether they, it's, it's correct to believe that or not, we can debate, but that is the perception. So if you don't, if you if you have people who believe um, there's already bias, and then they look around and they don't see anyone uh, who who looks like them, who has a similar background or or uh, can, who represents them, that's going to add to that apprehension or that perception that this is not fair. Uh, and th even though that is a part of the justice system, ADR really is justice. It's mm -hmm. part of it's a private system mm -hmm. of dispute resolution. Uh, but one needs to feel that even in these uh, circumstances that, that you, you have uh, an opportunity to be heard and, to, and that is fair uh, and that people are, who are judging you uh, understand you and understand your background. I mean, we just had that wonderful presentation from Professor Snyder about you know, what do you see when you look at me? You, what, what don't you see? What do I bring? Uh, I think when people look at me, they're going to make certain assumptions, but it's it's pretty interesting whenever I go and talk about ADR, the almost is like relief that people of color uh, feel when they see that I'm the ABA president or when I talk to law students, and especially young women, and they look at me and they say, wow, you did this, then there's something that I can do. So there is something that is very tangible about representation and uh, th there's no denying that. So having the ability to have more diversity in our uh, options is, is really uh, what will restore confidence, uh, I think, in, in our justice system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're right, ADR is, is justice, it is private justice and it's, it's an individual or, or a party's, um, you know, access to um, people that they hope will understand them, that they hope will will listen to their case and 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 kind of you know be fair, be neutral, and to have an expanded roster of people that people feel like they can relate to is certainly going to be helpful. It's going to help everybody. And let's not forget, even though I have the uh, my background is international arbitration, ADR touches every field. Mm -hmm. So. What labor, uh, you know, wh whether it is um, uh, employment, whether it is, you know, commercial, small business cases, whatever it might be, whether it's education, uh, we can take our ADR skills into every facet of a person's life. Um, and when we do that, they need to feel that that representation is there uh, and that they will have confidence because of that. Mm -hmm. Wow! Thank thank you so much, uh, President Unix Ross. This was a a really great a really great discussion, and um, certainly learning a lot tonight from everyone. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, and as always, thank you for the excellent way that you you moderate and you bring out such thoughtful questions. You you get people to really. Uh, dig deeper and I appreciate that about you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, great.